Thank you for joining us for the Lifelong Learning at Home series presented by the Laurier Association for Lifelong Learning. For over 20 years, the Laurier Association for Lifelong Learning has been offering unique adult learning opportunities on Laurier's Waterloo and Brantford campuses. Our non-credit courses are intended for personal interest and self-education. We're pleased to offer you this opportunity to learn from your own home and are excited to be joined today by Scott Gallimore. Scott Gallimore is an Associate Professor of Archaeology and Heritage Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. He is a Roman archaeologist who has worked on numerous archaeological projects in different parts of Greece. In 2017, he was Laurier's recipient of the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance Award for Excellence in Teaching. Thank you for joining us today, Scott. We will now turn it over to you for your lecture. So let us be merry. Wine is life, an archaeology of wine in the Roman world. Very excited to be a part of this series, especially, uh, I guess, to be the first one that you're going to see starting on May 12th. And what I wanted to do today is talk about something that I've been studying for the past few years, which is wine within the Roman world. So I'm, my plan is to cover a number of different ways that we have evidence for wine. I'm going to go back before the Roman world at one point to kind of think about what the earliest evidence we have for wine in the archaeological record is. And then we're going to focus in on a case study for the island of Crete, where I've done a lot of my research, which gives us a nice perspective of how wine would have been consumed in the Roman world. I know it's very easy to think that everyone would have just been drinking wine, but it turns out there's a number of different ways that they would have used it throughout kind of their daily life. So that is the goal that we're going to be covering over the course of today. And I think wine in many ways is synonymous with Greek and Roman culture, where here we have an image from Greek art of a symposium, and really the idea of drinking wine, banqueting, having these philosophical conversations has been passed down to us by a number of sources. That is an important component of it, and we can see that in both Greek culture and Roman culture, although the one caveat is a lot of those literary sources are written by the upper classes, and they tend to be written for the upper classes. So one thing we are going to try and explore a little bit more today also is how wine would have been treated among the rest of the population, kind of beyond the ones who would have been able to have a symposium like this and just kick back and drink wine with all of their friends on a regular basis. Well, these images come to us from the Roman world, and they give us a few different interesting perspectives of some of the different ways we can think about wine. So, for instance, the image on the right-hand side of the screen, which is actually a painting from the site of Pompeii in Italy, so a site that was destroyed by a volcanic eruption in AD 79, here we have a very clear connection to wine, where we have the volcano, Mount Vesuvius, in the background. You'll notice that on the left-hand side of that volcano there are in fact are grape trellises that are represented and then we have the god Bacchus decked out in grapes so a very direct association and in fact during the first century AD the region of Pompeii was the most important supplier of wine within the Roman Empire the fertile volcanic soil made it very ideal for growing conditions. And we have evidence for wine from Pompeii across the entire Roman Empire and even outside of the Roman Empire in places like India. So they were a very vibrant industry, although that did suffer quite a bit when the eruption occurred. In the upper left-hand part of the screen, it's just a mosaic from North Africa showing different individuals and it being served wine. One interesting point about that image is it looks like they're getting served wine into plates almost, and it turns out there were a number of different types of vessels used for drinking wine, serving wine, storing it throughout the Roman world, and it wasn't just cups that were often used. And then the other image is interesting. It's from a mosaic flooring in Cyprus. And what it's meant to represent, at least within Greco-Roman mythology, is the very first instance where wine was consumed, where the story goes in those cultures that the gods, specifically the wine god Dionysus, passed on the knowledge of how to make wine to a man named Acarius, who here is the man leading the wagon 
filled with sacks of wine, it turns out. The two slightly inebriated shepherds on the other part, the inscription above them actually says that they are the first wine drinkers where Acarius had created his first vintages. He was on the road and apparently he encountered some shepherds and shared it with them. And they thought this was the greatest thing that had ever happened. Unfortunately, the next morning they woke up and felt they had been poisoned and they drove Acarius out of the village. And it might not be too surprising that the story of the first people to drink wine is also the story of the first people to get a hangover from drinking wine. But it didn't stop anyone. And as we'll see, of course, it did become a very important part of Roman culture as well. But before we explore what is going on within the Roman world, I did want to think a little bit about what is the earliest evidence we have for wine within the archaeological record. And there's a couple of reasons this is interesting. And one is the fact that there always is a fascination with what is the earliest in archaeology. Where do you find the earliest evidence for something? And the fact that the earliest evidence we have was discovered quite recently in 2017 by a project out of the University of Toronto that in fact includes some former Laurier students. So there is a bit of a direct connection to Laurier in that way. And in this case, we do have to go to the former Soviet republics, the Caucasus region, and specifically the countries of Georgia and Armenia, which have really traded off over the years, which one has the earliest evidence for wine. And it is a bit of a competition because you can imagine there's also some tourist dollars and some pride that might be attached to this, where if you're the country that has the earliest evidence for wine, that might be a place that a number of people want to go visit. And there's a lot of different instances where this evidence has come to the foreground. So here, for instance, we can see a photograph of a winemaking installation in Armenia that dates to 6,000 years ago. And it shows us that this production was not necessarily small scale, even though wine was fairly new at this point, where we have a lot of storage containers where the fermentation could take place place and clearly they were making and probably consuming wine on a fairly large scale. The vessel here that's portrayed on the right in fact is what is now the earliest evidence for the production of wine. It was a vessel discovered during excavations in Georgia in 2017 dating to about 8,000 years ago. Now one of the questions is how could just a fragmentary pottery vessel like this actually be evidence of wine. You'll notice at the top of the vessel, it does seem to have this relief decoration, this little cluster of balls or berries that is thought to maybe represent grapes. But if that was all the evidence we had, this wouldn't be overly convincing because there's a lot of different things those clusters could be. But fortunately, when they excavated this vessel, and they protected it in a way that they were able to take residue samples from the interior. And those samples are what show us that in fact, 8,000 years ago, this vessel held wine at one point. And it could only hold wine if wine was really in existence. So it pushes the date back for the earliest examples of wine when wine was being manufactured. And as for the residue samples themselves, how does that happen? Well, if we were living in the world of CSI, all you'd really have to do is take a scraping, field, field, feed it into a machine like a mass spectrometer, and a couple seconds later, it would magically tell us that wine was there. And unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Where we still need to take the samples very carefully, we still use equipment like a mass spectrometer, but when it gives us an answer, it's not a specific commodity. What it is, is just a breakdown of what was in that particular residue, and that has to be interpreted. And what these graphs show are the analysis of that specific wine vessel from Georgia. And you'll notice the presence of four different acids. And what happens when we do residue analysis in archaeology is we're looking for something called a biomarker, where all of the different products which you might expect to be contained in these vessels, whether it's wine, olive oil, beer, honey, milk, anything like that, have their own individual biomarkers. And in this case, the presence of those four acids is what tells us that in fact wine was what was in this container. That is what we're looking for. Unfortunately, it doesn't just say wine when there's a feed out. But 
at the very least, it's exciting because it tells us when wine probably was first being developed. It gives us a region, since this evidence does keep coming out of the area of Georgia and Armenia, it looks like the earliest fermentation of grape juice and wine occurred in that area, and then it must have spread out from those particular regions. Within the Mediterranean itself, so the heart of Greek and Roman culture, we do have evidence of wine going back over 5,000 years ago. So the spread from that region next to the Black Sea down into the Mediterranean probably occurred over a few hundred years after that wine production facility that we see in Armenia. And in this case, we're looking at a site on the southeastern coast of Crete that has evidence for the manufacture of wine, for the drinking of wine, the storage, and it dates back to the early Bronze Age on that island. So again, it shows us the spread, and maybe not surprisingly, the earliest evidence we have for the wine god Dionysus also comes from the island of Crete. And this island was the home to a famous Bronze Age civilization known as the Minoans, and <clears throat> in many ways it seems to have had a lot of connections to other parts of of Europe and the Mediterranean, and it's not surprising we have a lot of early evidence for products like wine in that area. And then, of course, I mean, I'm skipping over a number of different steps, but we do know within the Roman world that they had ready access to wine, and that pretty much every region under contr the control of the Romans manufactured their own vintages. What's interesting about this, where you could imagine, for instance, a region like Pompeii, one of the most important wine producing regions of the first century AD, why would they need anyone else's wine? Well, it turns out there was a lot of exchange of wine as well, where the fact that you grew it and made it yourself did not necessarily mean that you weren't open to drinking vintages from other areas. And here again, just providing a few other images that reflect on some of the evidence we have. So in the upper left-hand corner, corner, we have another mosaic floor showing the stomping of grapes to create the juice, the must, that would then be fermented into wine. So a technique that's still used by a number of wine producers today and was common back then. And you can even see it pouring down into these large storage vessels. And interestingly enough, we even seem to have a Seder participating. And wine, of course, was associated with a lot of different religious entities within the Greco-Roman world as well. The bottom image on the left-hand side are packaging containers known as amphoras. So this was the standard shipping container of the Roman world. So if you needed to get wine from point A to point B, whether it was overland or on a ship, this is traditionally what you would use. And almost every region that made wine or other products like olive oil had their own version of these containers. And there may have been a bit of branding or marketing involved in that where people could recognize where something was coming from by the shape and style of the container it was in. And they're fairly large. They tend to average about 26 liters in capacity. And as you can see, we find lots of them. And they're good evidence for the exchange of wine across different regions. In fact, the reason we know that there's wine from Pompeii in India is finding examples of transport containers like this there. And then the other image shows us, of course, there would have been a lot of wine salesmen, little shops spread throughout Roman cities where you could go and buy these different vintages. This is an intriguing image since it appears that the person buying the wine is a child of about four years old, and it suggests that the rules around it were a little different than what we expect today. Although you can imagine here that you know mother or father handed a container and some money to the child and said, well, we need you to go pick up some wine for us around the corner. And he goes and it's being poured out into these little transportable a container. So we have a lot of different elements of what went on within wine culture. And as for a question, for instance, what might have been the drinking age in something like the Roman world, I don't think they had any specific regulations, but I do expect that they probably started fairly young. Although, as we'll talk about in a little bit, they very rarely drank their wine pure. They always cut it with water, so it was diluted in a sense, meaning they weren't really necessarily drinking it with the in intent of getting as drunk as possible. One of the more famous literary texts that we have that talks about wine 
in a few different contexts is this work known as the Satyricon by an author called Petronius. And Petronius was writing around the time that an individual named Nero was emperor of the Roman Empire. And Nero was in power from about AD 54 to 68. And in this case, this satirical work is based on the sense that there was a lot of nouveau riche rising up within Roman culture during the period of the early Roman Empire. And this was frustrating a lot of individuals because it didn't seem that a lot of these people kind of gaining all of this wealth were really demonstrating a lot of the, the class, the social values that earlier Romans had demonstrated. And in particular, there's a story within the Satyricon about a man named Trimalchio who was a freed slave who had become immensely wealthy and it was just over extravagant everything he was trying to show off and this painting isn't a direct reference to Trimalchio but it does kind of give us a sense of what might have been going on he holds a dinner party with his friends apparently he was quite overweight and all he wanted to do was show off in fact the title of this lecture so let us be merry wine is life is a quote spoken by Trimalchio within this story and in that case it's because he decided to serve as guests a vintage that apparently was 100 years old and he was talking about the fact that wine might be immortal well man is mortal so he was thinking that wine kind of even outlives all of the individuals there but it's kind of meant to be ridiculous he talks about all of the estates that he owns most of which he'll never see how he's bringing in wine on ships from all over the place kind of serving people almost ridiculous amounts of food, but it also kind of gives us a sense that wine was very closely tied to a lot of these different factors because that is one of the things he is specifically showing off, the expensive vintages that he can serve within a dinner party like this. Well, one other point that I've always found fascinating, and this is where a lot of my own studies of archaeology have ventured into, because I do tend to analyze pottery for the most part and use that to try and reconstruct trade networks and think about the different types of commodities that were being exchanged across the Roman Empire. And when it comes to something like amphoras, they are some of the best sources of evidence we have for tracing the connections between different regions. Now, in this case, when I'd mentioned that containers tend to be very distinct and you can associate them with particular regions, this is a type of container that was quite popular during the first century BC and was manufactured at sites along the western coast of Italy. In fact, one of the regions where it was made was the area around Pompeii, but it was also made in a few other areas as well. It's something we very strongly associate with Italian wine <clears throat> being shipped to a number of areas. And as it turns out, a lot of different shipwrecks in the Mediterranean have been found with these containers as part of their cargo. And here you can see a reconstruction of how you would stack these containers within the hold of a ship. It does look a little precarious. And one comment that's often made about these amphoras is if they were meant to be shipping containers, their design does not seem to be conducive to stacking, especially with these narrow spikes at the bottom. One thing about those is a lot of times they might have served as a third handle, meaning you could tip up the vessel and pour the wine out that way. And probably there would have been a lot of straw and packing material and ropes to keep everything in place. Some of these shipwrecks though tell us that the amount of wine being produced and exchanged within the Roman world was massive. One shipwreck alone, for instance, that was found off the coast of France that had these exact vessels in it had over 10,000 of them. And since they have a capacity of about 26 liters, that means one ship held over 260,000 liters of wine that was probably going from Italy to France. And what's interesting about that, there was also wine going from France to Italy at the exact same time. But these are huge quantities. It's not just small scale production but you're also trying to supply cities like Rome, which may have had a population of 1 million people by the first century AD, and keeping a steady supply going from a number of different areas. I mentioned French wine, and French wine is actually one of the more frustrating things to deal with within the Roman world, and that's because early on during the period of the Republic, the second and first century BC, and into the early period of the empire within Roman history, the first century AD, 
French wine was being transported in those ceramic amphoras, and it's a fairly easy form to identify, and you can start to trace it throughout different areas of the Roman Empire. By the second century AD, though, French wine seems to disappear from <clears throat> the archaeological record across the Roman world. And this is a bit surprising considering today French wine is one of those kind of groups that's praised among a lot of aficionados. So what was going on? Well, it turns out during that period, instead of using ceramic containers, a lot of French producers decided that they preferred to use wooden barrels. They could hold more than the amphoras and they were better suited to river transport. And this was one of the tricks of being a coastal Mediterranean province or one that actually had land up more in continental Europe where you were relying on river networks in order to get goods from one place to another and putting these wooden barrels on a barge was a lot easier and then you could get them down to the Mediterranean, put them on a ship and send them to a place like Rome. The problem is the barrels don't really survive in the archeological record. So we don't have a good sense of just how common or how popular wine from that region was in that point. Although we do know there were a lot of different containers being used. They used ceramic amphoras to transport it. They used wooden barrels. They would also use skins, kind of <clears throat> calf skins, something like that tied up that could hold large quantities of wine as well. It just happens that it's the ceramic vessels that we often have the best evidence for. As for the wine itself, this is an interesting question to explore. Was it white wine or red wine? We actually have good evidence that probably both were being produced within the context of the Roman Empire. But what would it taste like? Is it something that would be recognizable to us? Did they add things or do <clears throat> certain things that may have changed the taste and make it a little more unrecognizable? Well, one thing, especially when it comes to these ceramic containers, having that wine mix with the clay surface for a long period of time can actually impact the taste quite negatively. So it looks like a lot of <clears throat> different producers would coat the inside of these amphoras with pine resin or pitch. And here you can see that black residue across the top of this amphora is evidence of that. And that probably would have impacted the taste itself. In Greece, <clears throat> if you've ever visited there, there's a type of wine you can get which is called retsina, which is produced in the same way. It's fermented in barrels that are coated with a pine resin. And I will say I enjoy drinking, but it's definitely an acquired taste. It has a bit of a kick or tang that's very unexpected for wine, but that's something we would probably expect for a lot of these different vintages. They would need to seal these vessels, otherwise the wine would sour, turn to vinegar quite quickly, and they would use plaster, ceramic, they would use cork in some instances, and they would stopper these vessels in a number of different ways. And you might notice too, there's some lettering written on the outside of this amphora, and this was fairly common too. Sometimes they would put a stamp in a place like the handle, in other cases they would write on the surface, and the goal here is that they were trying to tell you what the contents of the amphora were. Oftentimes they would tell you it was wine, for instance, of excellent quality. Whether it was excellent or not may have been debatable, but no one would probably write on their surface that this is wine that tastes bad or something like that. It would give you the region and oftentimes tell you the producer. And this may have been ways also for merchants to keep track of who was owed money as these things were being traded from place to place. So those are different ways we can think about wine. And I do think it probably would not have been quite as recognizable a taste as we might expect, because even one thing that probably also sounds surprising, they would add olive oil to their wine, which <clears throat> You say that and it kind of makes you cringe a little bit, but it turns out olive oil was a bit of a preservative. It helped to keep the wine stable so it didn't convert to something like vinegar, although you do hope they had some way of siphoning off the oil from the wine and not trying to drink them together, although we don't really have a lot of evidence beyond residues that something like that was going on. There were a lot of different ways to get wine. We saw evidence a little earlier of a shop where you could go and probably pick out different vintages, but we also know there were a lot of restaurants and taverns within Roman cities. In this case, Herculaneum, which is a site not that far from Pompeii, 
also destroyed during the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79, there's a lot of these different L-shaped and U-shaped counters that would have been <clears throat> used to serve and sell different types of drink and food. Now, whether the wine may have been in these ceramic containers that are embedded within this counter is a bit debatable. Some people have argued that, in fact, you wouldn't want to put something of wine in there because it would be hard to clean them and you would never get the dregs out of the bottom. And we will see there might be some other ways you could serve it as well, but these counters are very common at a number of different sites and show us that there were places where you could probably go and just get a drink with your friends, much like happens today. And what this is meant to represent, this is a plan of the site of Pompeii. And all of those dots represent places where one of those counters has been found. So they're evident at Herculaneum and also at Pompeii. And there's about 158 dots on this plan, which is impressive since the cross hatching here represents the one third of Pompeii that's never been excavated. So there's a lot of different restaurant areas within a fairly small city. And it's intriguing to see how much they cluster together where <clears throat> maybe not all of them were selling wine, but clearly a lot of things were for sale across the city. Now, Pompeii might be a bit of an exception to the rule, and one reason for that is it was a harbor town. So you would expect that there was a lot of sailors coming in and out, especially during the sailing season, which lasted from March through October within the Roman world. We have evidence for hotels and inns at Pompeii, so they seem to have really tried to accommodate this itinerant population. And maybe not surprising, there was a lot of a drinking culture there as well, since there was fairly ready access to a lot of these different types of wine, these different establishments. And we do even have a few examples of these taverns at Pompeii, which would have warnings up on the wall, things like if you fight, you get kicked out, if you get drunk, and rowdy you get kicked out so they even had to establish their own rules around this as well and here this is just some more evidence from herculaneum and herculaneum in fact is a little better preserved than pompeii it was destroyed earlier during the eruption and a lot of the perishable materials like the wood <clears throat> is still present and here we say see a tavern where a number of these wine amphora are still preserved in place. And rather than getting the wine out of those containers in the <clears throat> taverna counter itself, maybe you would have got it down from these shelving areas. And in this case, we have an inscription, which is interesting because it also tells us that there were different types and values of wine. So you can drink here for one ass, and that was a bronze coin that was standard part of Roman currency during the period of the first century AD. If you give two, you will drink better. It'd be interesting to know what the bad wine in that context would be. And if you give four, you will drink Falernian. And this is something we hear quite a lot about, where particularly in Italy, there were regions that produced famous types of wine. So Falernian was one of them that in fact comes from not that far away from where Pompeii is. There was another one called Cistercian wine. In fact, if you look at shows like HBO's Rome, and others like that. They often make direct reference to these types <clears throat> of vintages. And Trimalchio, when he talks about this wine that's supposedly 100 years old, he's actually talking about a Falernian vintage in that case. So not surprisingly, there was a quality, much like if we walk into an LCBO, not all wines are priced equally. And that was the same in this case. Well, that does bring us to a question though. Well, <clears throat> how did Roman populations actually deal with wine on a daily basis? Up to this point, and many of the ways I've been talking about it, the assumption is of course that they would drink wine. And here we can see individuals being served, presumably at some type of taverna or restaurant where there's all sorts of vessels and of wine available in the back and a cup is being passed on to one of the customers where that would have been one of the main ways. You make wine to drink it. I mean, that would be one of its primary functions. Although it turns out it's probably a little more complicated than that. And it wasn't just about having one other thing to drink beyond water or what other beverages there might have been. It actually played a role in a number of different facets within the daily life of Roman culture. And I do want to try and explore what some of those might be. And one of them, and I mean, and this goes along with a lot of the things that we talk about today, where there's this argument 
a glass or two of red wine a day might be healthy. And there's a lot of different Mediterranean countries, France, Italy, Greece, where that is argued. In fact, I seem to recall a news story from a few years ago that wine lobbyists in France were trying to get kind of the two glasses recommended per day changed to three glasses recommended per day, which probably would have benefited their bottom line. But you hope that maybe there was a little bit of backing of science behind that as well. There are certain nutrients in wine that would have been beneficial and may not have been available in as wide <clears throat> a kind of scale as could be in other instances. But another thing about it that's been argued is, well, why is it that Romans and other populations of this period tended to cut their wine with water? Was it simply a matter that they didn't want to get drunk, that that was kind of against the social norm, it was taboo, or were there other explanations that we can look for? The image here on the right hand side of the screen is water pipes at Pompeii and Pompeii produces a very intricate plumbing system <clears throat> that would supply water from kind of different distribution hubs into individual households. And if you're looking at this water pipe and kind of getting a little suspicious about what it's made of, that in fact is a lead pipe. And lead was the primary material that was used in a lot of Roman cities for their water supply systems. And not surprisingly, this has, had, has led to a lot of arguments about lead poisoning among Roman populations. And at Pompeii, study of human skeletal remains recovered from the destruction debris does show they had elevated quantities of lead within their system. Now, I don't think adding wine to your water would deal with anything lead-based, but <clears throat> When we think about how sanitary was a lot of the water that the Romans may have been drinking, if they're getting it out of different cisterns, if they're getting it from river systems and so on, there is an argument that maybe instead of cutting their wine with water, they're cutting their water with wine and, and if maybe trying to use the alcoholic component to sanitize the water a little bit. This might depend on how much cutting they were doing. Were they diluting the wine to the point where it was really just kind of water flavored like wine, or were they just adding a little bit to kind of cut back on the intense flavor that the wine might have had? Those are difficult things to say because no Roman author ever explains those intricacies to us. That's something that would have been understood within the culture and they never needed to really write it down. But it is interesting to think if maybe something like wine was used to in prove health in certain ways in an era where there was a lot of potential for disease and medical treatments weren't quite available to deal with a lot of them. In another case, I mean, <clears throat> as we've seen even with the case of Trimalchio, for instance, and Petronius Satyricon, serving wine to guests was also of vital importance within Roman culture. And we do have an understanding that when you would enter someone's household, one of the first things they would offer to you is a drink. And again, that's something which should be fairly familiar to us today. I don't think we'd necessarily offer them wine by default, but you'd offer them water, coffee, juice, and whatever they might want. But in this case, it does seem like wine was part of that social nicety. And this was an area to show off that you were a good host, that you would do something along these proper cultural channels. And it was also a way like Tremolchio to show off a little bit, where if you had some important guests coming by, you would pull out the expensive wine and show off that you were able to afford vintages like that. And maybe if you had someone coming by that you didn't like, you would pull out the stuff that you wouldn't really want to drink yourself and give it to them. And we have good indications that a lot of this was going on. This image here, which seems to show Cupid's drinking wine, comes again from a painting at Pompeii. And what it seems to be is a tasting in this case, where if you were going to buy and sell wine, we also know that you were able to taste it in advance to make sure it was good quality and you weren't buying a bunch of containers filled with something like vinegar by accident. So, <clears throat> but a lot of this would build in as well, that it was tied to a lot of these social niceties within the culture. And as for evidence that there may have been these attempts to only serve certain types of wine to certain people, we have an interesting letter here from a politician named Pliny the Younger. And Pliny was a very prominent politician within the Roman Empire during the end of the first century AD and the beginning of the second century AD. In fact, he was a very good friend of the Emperor Trajan at the time, and we have a lot of his correspondence preserved. His two most famous letters, as it turns out, he was 
an eyewitness to the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that destroyed Pompeii and talks about what happened in that case. In this instance, he's talking about going to a dinner party and doesn't seem to be too impressed with the host. So when he talks about dining at the home of a certain acquaintance where there was good wine, medium quality wine, and bad wine. And fortunately, Pliny, who was fairly high up within the political spectrum, got the good stuff. But wouldn't it be interesting to be at the dinner table where you get the second grade wine because you're a lesser friend? It might have made for some interesting conversation. And then the freedmen, so in this case, these are individuals who were freed slaves. And a lot of those individuals, like Trimalchio, could in fact become quite prosperous after being free especially if they had been the slave of someone who is quite wealthy and important in Roman society who would then set them up with their own estates and their own wealth but it turns out they may have still been a little bit down the social hierarchy and here we have someone who's trying to display that specifically by serving out different types of wine among all of these different individuals. Well, we've talked about a few different ways that wine may have been consumed kind of part of daily life. <clears throat> and to keep that discussion going, I do want to talk about wine produced during the Roman period on the Greek island of Crete. So we saw that, in fact, Crete is one of the earliest areas in the Mediterranean where we have evidence for wine dating back over 5,000 years ago. But it also turns out during the Roman period, when Crete was a province part and part of the Roman Empire, it was one of the most important suppliers of wine within the entire Roman world, in particular to cities like Rome. And it might seem a little surprising since if you go to an LCBO, wine from Crete is not really displayed prominently, if at all, compared to other things like Italian, French, and so on. But during this period, it seemed to have controlled a very significant part of the market. And this has led me to kind of wonder, well, why was that? <clears throat> I've done a lot of research on Crete and have been trying to ask, well, why would something like wine from this island be so popular? What were the attributes? How was it consumed that may have led to that type of control of the market? And again, what is our evidence for this? These are the ceramic packaging containers. These are the specific types that would have been used for wine on Crete during the period from about the first century AD through the third century AD. So there are four primary types that were manufactured. As for the abbreviation at the bottom, the AC, it stands for Amphor Cretois. So it's a French designation, and it was French archaeologists in the 1980s who first came up with this classification scheme. The first three types are in fact quite similar. They're <clears throat> roughly the same shape and size. They have a capacity in the neighborhood of 24 to 26 liters. And the fourth one, which is quite different, especially with those spiked handles, is probably modeled off an amphora that was produced on another island in the region called Rhodes, and maybe was meant to be a bit of an imitation, copying that style and maybe even trying to pass off Rhodian wine coming from an island like Crete. It's also about half the size of the other ones, only has a capacity of about 12 or 13 liters. Well, where the evidence that Cretan wine is quite popular <clears throat> comes from is really Rome itself. And what this graph is meant to represent, in studying pottery assemblages at Rome and the amphora component of them, you're able to come up with the quantity of wine that was probably coming from different regions. Again, because these containers are fairly easy to identify, you can assign them to regions and start saying, well, these are the ones for wine from Crete, the ones for wine from Italy, and so on. Well, in this case, and what this graph is meant to represent as the number, the proportion of Cretan amphoras compared to other amphoras found at Rome during these periods. So during the middle of the first century, about 8% of all of the amphoras found at Rome were coming from Crete, which is a fairly good number when you consider how large of a city that would have been. By the late first century, we're up to 12%. And then by the middle of the second century, 20% of the wine consumed in Rome, the capital of this empire, seems to be coming from Crete, one fifth of the market. The only wine that was consumed more was wine from Italy itself. And there's only one other commodity that could even match Cretan wine, and it was olive oil coming from Spain. 
Now, <clears throat> I've always wondered about this because, well, how is it that this small island, this very kind of small province within this very large empire could control a market like Rome to this degree? What was appealing about Cretan wine that would let it kind of have that type <clears throat> of share of a market like this, especially since, as I mentioned, it's not like Greek wine or Cretan wine is very popular today compared to a lot of other European countries. So what was going on during this period? Well, the first thing is to consider, well, what was Cretan wine like? And we have a lot of literary references that describe it, and they tend to use the same vocabulary. And it's vocabulary, whether in Greek or in Latin, that translates as raisin wine, so a sweet wine, a thicker type of wine than we'd probably be accustomed to, something more along the lines of a dessert wine, for instance. And this is where they would let the <clears throat> grape or dry out a little bit to the point where they were basically raisins. Then they would press them to get the juice out, and it would be highly saturated with sugar. So that would produce this sweeter type. And I mentioned here that it goes by some other names known as Mulvesi or Monsi, those actually are names that are prevalent during a later period of history. It turns out that Crete was also a part of the Venetian Empire <clears throat> a few hundred years ago, and in fact, it was the most important supplier of wine to Venice as well. So this was a history that lasted well over a thousand years. We think it's kind of both, we hear about both red wine and white wine coming out of these traditions, but to one extent, it is this sweeter, thicker raisin wine that we're talking about. Well, was it good is another question. And this is where the literary references are also interesting because on a lot of Cretan amphora, there is a painted inscription that says excellent Cretan wine. But again, that probably was advertising to an extent. And these two references give us a bit of a different perspective. So Marshall was a poet during the latter part of the first century AD, and here he's talking about wine from Crete. So the vintage from Knossos and Minoan Crete, which is a poor man's replacement for honeyed wine. And that does not seem to be a complimentary statement if it's a poor man's replacement. And it turns out Marshall tells us the best kind of honeyed wine you could get is you would take Falernian wine from Italy and mix it with wine from the region of, or sorry, mix it with honey from the region of Athens in Greece. So that would produce good honeyed wine. And apparently this sweeter wine from Crete was what you would do if you were poor. And I think that's important to consider because if Cretan wine really did control something like 20% of the market of Rome in the mid second century AD, it clearly was not a luxury item. It was something that was probably inexpensive. It was available kind of across the social spectrum and in particular to the significant part of the population that would have been fairly poor within a city like Rome. And then here we have a letter <clears throat> that dates to the second century AD. In fact, it's a letter written to an emperor, Marcus Aurelius. It's like asking a host who offers you Falernian wine, this very highly esteemed Italian vintage from his own estates for Cretan or Sagentine instead. So if you're gonna ask for bad wine, it turns out Cretan might be one of the choices. So these are upper class statements. So it could be a wine that was looked down upon, but it was something that probably was widely available. It's what the lower classes were able to access within these markets since they probably couldn't afford something like Falernian on any type of a regular basis or at all. Another thing that's quite interesting about Cretan wine is <clears throat> its thickness may have been part of the appeal as well. That higher sugar content, the fact that it was a little more syrupy, made it much more stable. And we have a lot of good evidence from the Roman Empire from legal texts that tell us a major concern of people buying wine was that they didn't want it to turn sour quickly. We have papyrus contacts that were produced <clears throat> or preserved from us from Egypt that in fact tell us that oftentimes when people sold wine to a consumer, there was a guarantee in place that that wine would not turn sour for about four to five months afterwards. So if you could have a vintage that would be fairly stable, that would be 
important. And it turns out Cretan wine had that capability. And this is also a reason why it was so popular in the area of the Venetian Empire as well. And in this case, these two images both come from Pompeii. The image on the right, all of those vessels in the top of the image are all amphoras from Crete. So here at Pompeii, we see <clears throat> these vessels are kind of dominating these assemblages. It's not just Rome where it was quite popular. In fact, it's one of the most common types of amphoras you see at Pompeii as well, suggesting it was popular. This stability and the fact that it was able to be stable in these ceramic containers also helps explain why Cretan wine isn't as popular today, because when the French really developed the wine bottle with the cork that made all wine stable, it meant that maybe some of these vintages were weren't as appealing to a lot of people, fell by the wayside. And we don't see as much of this Cretan raisin wine today as we would have in those periods. There are some other ways that this wine would have been consumed as well. And one of the things if we think it's a thicker wine, and in this case, this Malmsey, which is not Cretan wine, but again, that word at the bottom, Madeira, might be starting to kind of signal a few of the different directions I might be taking also, is that it probably was very highly used in cooking. And we do have a cookbook preserved from the Roman world. It was written by an author named Apicius, and it provides us with hundreds of recipes of different Roman dishes. And what's interesting, almost every single one of those recipes, one of the ingredients is raisin wine. Specifically, it's the Latin word passum, P-A-S-S-U-M, but it tells us that that type of wine was a very common ingredient in cooking. So a lot of times, if you were going to get something like wine from Crete, you weren't necessarily going to drink it, you would be using a lot of it in cooking, making your different recipes, and that could help explain its popularity within a city like Rome as well. And it also shows us that something like wine was being used in a number of different contexts. Now, the image on the left showing you kind of a random bush might seem <clears throat> a little odd, but this also plays into something else about the island of Crete. During the Roman Empire, Crete was the most important supplier of medicinal plants within the Roman world. Apparently it had the highest quality medicinal plants and the best variety. So the island had a very good reputation when it came to medicine. And what's interesting, we have a number of different literary references <clears throat> to Cretan wine, upwards of about 80 or 90 individual references, and about 70% of those references come from medical texts. So these are medical authors writing about treatments, and they are specifically mentioning Cretan wine over and over again. So it suggests that it may have also had medicinal properties, and then that might have been its association with an island that already had those properties in place. And apparently it was used as a cough syrup, apparently it could cure <clears throat> a variety of different things, even asthma, and we even have a veterinary text preserved for us from the Roman period, where if a horse is coughing, the best thing to give it is wine from Crete. So it was used in a number of those different ways. We also have some references that tell us that Cretan producers were among the first in the Roman Empire to add botanicals to their wine. And there has been an argument that, well, since all of these references that talk about it not being good wine, this might have been a way of improving the taste, but I think it might have also been a way of doubling down on this medical reputation and kind of building up the medical properties of these vintages as well. But it also shows us that wine played a very significant role in daily life. Yes, you could drink it. It was part of serving as a host, but it also kind of was used in cooking. It was used <clears throat> as medicine, and there was a number of different varieties that were available to different segments of the population. As I get to the end of this, there's just a couple of other things I wanted to mention. And again, one of them is that kind of wine from Rome often does still play a role <clears throat> in what we do as archaeologists, kind of the fascination with what some of these vintages may have been like. If you recognize the individual <clears throat> in this photo, we have Jacques Cousteau here, the famous undersea explorer, who in fact was responsible for discovering and excavating a number of Roman period shipwrecks off the coast of France. 
There is a story, and I have no idea if it's apocryphal, where he apparently did find an amphora that was still sealed with Cretan wine that he cracked open on a ship and took a drink out from and said tasted fine. It's a little hard to believe that after 2,000 years, something would still be that stable under those conditions. But every so often, we do find something along those lines. And here you can see he's surrounded by these different types of amphoras, which would have brought these different types of wine to a number of different regions. The last thing I wanted to talk about, though, is one of the most interesting finds from the Roman world, a sealed glass bottle still filled with wine, or at least if you look at the image, it might have been wine at some point, it's something else entirely now, but to have something that's over 1600 years old that was never drunk. And in this case, <clears throat> it was found at a Roman period site in Germany. You can see even on display in a museum, and it's managed to survive a couple of world wars and some other disasters intact. Here we have what might be the best opportunity to get a sense of what Roman wine might be like. There is an argument that most of the alcohol is probably evaporated out of this. So whatever that kind of smudgy mess inside is. It's probably not wine. There is an argument, in fact, that there's probably a little bit of olive oil in there, again, acting as a preservative, but it shows us that we have a number of different containers that might be available. And if you're thinking back to something I mentioned earlier, that it was the French who kind of developed a few hundred years ago the cork wine bottle, the Romans apparently were able to do something similar, but it never caught on to any type of large degree. And it was those ceramic amphoras that were the main transport containers at that point. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed this overview of Roman wine and different ways it may have played with into the daily life of that culture. I have provided a few links to go along with this if you wanted to explore some things <clears throat> in more detail. One of them, in fact, is a clip on YouTube that talks about this glass bottle of wine briefly and provides a few more details. One is for a book that kind of talks about how we explore the early evidence of wine. Another is a news release that talks about those finds in Georgia, the earliest evidence for wine that we now have. And another also goes back to Georgia. And it's the idea, it's actually based on a UNESCO World Heritage designation that the production of wine in Georgia is actually quite traditional and it might be reminiscent of what we would expect even in something like the Roman world. So it gives us one of the better perspectives of how producers would have gone about making their vintages using the technology and the equipment of the time. I hope that everyone out there is safe and healthy <clears throat> and I look forward to doing something like this again in the future and connecting with everyone in a law class when we're available as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Scott, for your lecture. Scott has provided some additional materials, as he mentioned, that you may wish to review following this lecture to further your learning. These materials have been provided on the course webpage. We know that learning has and always will be a social activity, so we encourage you to share this lecture with friends and family to discuss what you have learned today. If you'd like to learn more about the Laurier Association for Lifelong Learning, please visit wlu.ca slash lall.